Well, good morning and happy new year. How about how about that music for so, so ominous for the new year? Kind of the anticipation is building. Uh, my name is Kip. I'm the campus pastor here, and we're so glad that you have chosen to join us today. Congratulations. You have perfect attendance this year for church. Give yourselves a hand, right? We'll, we'll see how that keeps going throughout the year, but uh, so glad you are with us today. Uh, I hope you had a great Christmas and New Year's season. Our family was able to get away. We went to Alabama. We drove 16 hours there. We drove 16 hours back for like 55 degree weather uh, at the beach, and it was totally worth it. Uh, so our family had a great time making memories, having some fun. And uh, if you know our family at all, you know my wife is, she's a planner. And so she actually planned this trip a year ago um, after we had come back last year from Alabama. She, like, right away booked it again. And, and she, she likes to plan everything out. She, if she would have it her way, every day of vacation would be planned out kind of hour by hour. Uh, I, however, am what they call an adventurer. And uh, I'm more of the wake up uh, one day and we'll just see what the day brings and we'll make the best of it. And that's kind of how I roll. My wife does not roll that way very well. And she also understands that our kids don't really function very well um, that way. Some of them are like, fine, you know, Easton, our youngest son, he just, what are we doing? I don't, whatever we're doing, you tell me, we'll go do it. Um, other of my kids, um, they need the plan to get mentally prepared. And if that plan changes, oh my goodness, look out. It's like the whole world is ending. Um, right? They have to be prepared mentally and, and, and all of that. And so I love my wife that she can plan things out and prepare our kids for what they can expect. Um, you know, while Jesus was leading his disciples uh, here on this earth, he had a lot of those spontaneous adventure moments. Whether it was, uh, well, boys, today we're going to feed all of these people, 5,000, and I got this little sack lunch here. And they're like, What? Hey, let's go on an adventure, and he feeds a whole bunch of people, or he's walking from town to town, healing random people as he goes, or they're walking through a farm field, and he's like, hey, let me teach you a lesson, and uses the farm field about a lesson to teach them, and we see Jesus and his disciples going through these spontaneous moments throughout life, but we also see Jesus being very uh, planned and strategic in his communication. We see him uh, setting expectations and planning things out for his disciples to be able to grasp and understand. In fact, there's a unique moment in humanity right before the time that Jesus is uh, betrayed and arrested, uh, crucified and beaten, where Jesus is preparing his disciples. This wasn't one of the spontaneous moments. This is he's laying out some changes that are coming, preparing them for uh, the impending future. And although they didn't understand or know exactly what he was talking about or, or what he w meant when he said trouble is coming and lurks on the other side of the door, so to speak, what Jesus is doing is he doesn't want them to get caught off guard and he doesn't want them to be surprised. So he's telling them what's coming their way. It reminds me of a scene in the movie Gladiator. All the guys are like, oh, now I'm tuned in. A movie I like. Uh, there's, a, there's this scene in Gladiator where, where Maximus Aurelius has been captured and he's fighting to the death in the Roman Colosseum. And he's with other uh, prisoners and they're standing in the Colosseum uh, awaiting the doors to open and what is certain death to come for them. All kinds of evil and violence about to come through this door. And in that moment, Maximus Aurelius, he, he turns to the men and he says, No matter what comes through those doors, listen to me and stay together. 
He encourages, challenges, calls them. He, he's saying, look, if, if you don't remember anything else, remember this. And this is what Jesus is doing in John chapter 16. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to John chapter 16. And Jesus is taking this moment to say, I don't have much time left here on earth. I'm going to be going away. I'm going to send you a helper, a comforter. But here's what you need to remember. Whatever comes through the doors of life, here's what you need to remember. When he says remember, what he's saying is you have to intentionally not forget. This is the reminder. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at John 16 to discover some of these same truths that Jesus had for his disciples that are true for us today. And as we begin a new year, standing behind the door of possibilities, the door of the unknowns, the ups and downs that may come our way, and we're going to learn some things to help us remember, come what may, I will not forget. No matter what comes my way this year, no matter what's beyond those doors, I'm going to remember. In fact, in the chapters before, Jesus is telling his disciples some tough truths, things that we don't always want to hear. And then he gets to John 16, and Jesus, he tells them why he has shared these things in, verse, in chapter 14 and 15, and he's like, here's why I'm telling you this. I have said these things to keep you from falling away. I, I've said all that I've said in the last two chap chapters. To eat. I'm telling you this now so that you won't stumble, you won't forget, you won't fall away later. Over the last three years, the disciples have been following Jesus. Wherever he went, they went. Whatever he did, they followed along. There were some moments, but overall, it was pretty easy going, smooth walking with Jesus. He kind of handled things. But now Jesus is saying, some changes are coming. I'm not going to be with you much longer. And he warns them about some things that might make them stumble. He's letting them know that there are some things that are coming in their path that they need to be prepared for. And he's not telling them this to discourage them. He's not trying to make them anxious or fearful but he does want them to be prepared. He doesn't want them to stumble. And here's why this is helpful. Here's why this is so important for us. Because what causes us to stumble is not what's in the path. What causes us to stumble, it's the surprise that we didn't know was going to be there. It's not that there's something there. It's that I, I got caught off guard. I wasn't prepared. I was surprised by it. I didn't know the test results were going to to tell me I have cancer. I didn't, I didn't know this was going to happen. It's the surprise. Just think over the last several months or weeks or years, what are the things that have knocked you down or pushed you off course? Was it the surprise of a pandemic or the surprise of how people dealt with it? Was it a personal health issue, a political leader, someone close to you deconstructing their faith, or, or a church leader that failed you? You see, it's always what we don't see coming that tends to knock us off balance. And so Jesus says, here's why I'm telling you these things, so that you're not surprised. To let you know ahead of time there are things coming, but you can be prepared. And so he continues in verse 2. He says, I, I'm telling you all of these things to keep you from falling away. See, they will put you out of the synagogue. The religious leaders are going to kick you out of church. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. Can you imagine being a disciple right now? Excuse me? <laughs> whoever kills me? What? What did I sign up for here? Jesus says that they will do these things because they have not known the Father, nor have they known me. But I have said these things to you. All the things that I've told you in chapter 15, I've told you these things that when their hour comes, when they try to kick you out, when they give death threats, when trouble comes, that you may remember that I have told you these things. In other words, Jesus says, I'm telling you now because it's coming, it's going to happen, and I don't want you to think that whatever comes through those doors was because I didn't know it was coming. I don't want you to think 
that whatever comes your way has caught me off guard. I don't want you to think that or interpret the circumstances of your life as evidence that I'm not in control. I'm telling you this now so that when it happens, whatever happens, when it comes your way, you know you can still trust me. Think about your life and how many situations and challenges you've faced in life and in marriage, at work, with friendships and relationships. How beneficial it would have been if someone would have given you a heads up. You're going to face some challenges. Things are not going to go your way. They're going to catch you off guard. But let me assure you, you can trust me still. It's to be expected. And Jesus is saying all of this so that his followers can navigate life. So that, some of your translations may say, so that you won't abandon your faith. So that you won't lose faith in me. And I want to pause for a moment here because I want to look at the things that Jesus is talking about. He starts off, I've said these things so that you won't walk away from your faith. And that's really good. But what are those things to help me not walk away from my faith? What For the sake of time, I want to just scan through chapter 15 and give you three main points that Jesus commands his followers, calls his followers, so that they don't walk away from their faith. Don't you think that could be helpful for us today? All right, there's one of us. Thanks, Caden. Here's the first thing Jesus gives them. Look, I don't want you to walk away from your faith. And so I've said these things for a reason. John chapter 15, verse 4, he says, abide in me. And I in you. In verse 5 he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. And here Jesus uses this example of a vine dresser, of a vineyard. He uses this example of wine making. And, and, and all of the, the rows and rows of vines. And how a vine dresser and a winemaker would take a branch maybe from a struggling plant, and he would cut it off and he would unite it or or graft it in to a stronger rooted system so that it could grow and flourish and produce more fruit. This is how wine is made, generally speaking. This is the process. They cut off, and and it's how they make new grapes. It's how different flavor profiles, and and they they graft this in. And Jesus uses this, this picture of plant botany to say it's the same for you and for me. To connect your life, you're called to graft your life into Jesus, the true source of life. Just like a branch that is struggling, if it's cut off, it's useless, but if it is grafted into a strong root system, it can flourish and grow and produce more fruit. And Jesus is saying, if you abide in me, if you are united and connected to me, No matter what comes through those doors, he says, unite your life to mine. Unite your life to Jesus. This is the first thing that can help keep you from stumbling and walking away from your faith when life gets hard. Come what may, I'm united to Christ. This doesn't mean that I'm simply connected to a church, although that can be helpful. It doesn't mean that I'm connected to a religion. That's probably not very helpful at all doesn't mean that I'm connected to an idea about Jesus, but rather that all aspects of my life, my priorities and my habits, my resources and actions, my attitudes, my thoughts, my speech, all of my life surrendered to uniting my life to Jesus, to his ways, to his word, to his love. That's actually the second thing Jesus gives us. He says, unite your mission to, the lo- to love like Jesus. That that the mission of your life, he says in verse 9 of chapter 15, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Here it is, abide in my love. Unite your life, you unite the mission and purpose of your life to loving like I've loved. You go down to verse 12 and he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Love is what has motivated all that God has done throughout history. Love is what has motivated Jesus' ministry here on earth. And it's what motivates us as Heritage Church to find the one who is lost and far from God and help people find and follow Jesus. It's attaching, uniting my mission for existence 
to love like Jesus loved. And when we unite our life to the command of Jesus to love others, we're reminded of the kind of love that we've been given, and that love prepares us to stay connected to Jesus no matter what comes our way. Unite your life to Jesus. Unite your mission to love like Jesus. Here's the last thing Jesus gives them to keep them from abandoning or walking away from their faith. Uh, John 15, verse 20. He says, remember the words that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And here Jesus tells us, look, I, remember, I'm telling you, life is going to get hard. People are going to come after you. They're going to persecute you like they persecuted me. Just remember. Don't forget. Remember the words of Jesus. Over the last couple of years, one of the things that has amazed me the most is watching how followers of Jesus have navigated the unforeseen challenges of life. Circumstances around COVID, politics, race, cultural ideologies, and watching relationships fall apart in division, even people walking away from their faith, discounting the role of community and life with each other, watching people stumble it's almost as if we've forgotten the words of Jesus. He says, I've told you these things so that you won't fall away, so that you will stay secure, that you would remember this life is filled with ups and downs, uncomfortable moments and seasons, people who behave like broken people and hurt people that hurt people. And I told you that there would be trouble so that when trouble comes, when it happens, whatever comes your way, you would still trust in me. I was amazed at how fast we saw so many lose their trust and their faith and lose their foundation as it was so shaken. See, the truth is, is that Jesus never painted a picture of peace and perfection here on earth. He never brought a version of the gospel that assured you that life will be smooth sailing. You'll never have to endure hardship that you'd be exempt from brokenness and, and hurt and pain. You'd be exempt from people and decisions who don't agree with you. This version of the gospel that tries to tell you otherwise. This version of the gospel uh, that, that maybe you thought was the case, that my life, when I come to Jesus, it'll be easier. That's not the gospel of Jesus. The gospel that Jesus came to bring is, come what may, I'm still with you. This is the gospel of the Bible. This is the gospel of Jesus. This is the good news. No matter what comes, because it's coming, but you can be assured I'm still with you. You don't have to navigate it alone. In the middle of the brokenness, I'm there. In the middle of the hardship, I'm still with you. In the middle of the pain, I can comfort you. You can still trust me, so stay united to me. Unite your mission to my love. Remember what I've told you. Don't get thrown off when trouble comes. And while this may be different than the gospel that some of you have heard, maybe you were told, you know, give your life to Jesus and it'll be smooth sailing, always sunny in 75. You wouldn't hear that here because that's not the gospel of Jesus. Because if that's the gospel you've attached your life to, then you're living in a way where once life actually happens, when trouble comes, you feel like it was a bait and switch. And I was told my life would get better, and it, all I can see is that it's gotten worse. It's gotten harder. It's been more challenging. People don't like me as much as they used to. Or, or somehow God has let me down. He didn't keep his end of the bargain. He failed me. You, decide, you end up deciding that faith and engaging in the life of the church, it's not as important. It's not as needed you know, sociologist Christian uh, Smith studied why people tend to drop out of church and why they walk away from their faith. This was his conclusion. The problem is many people who call themselves Christians, but their religion that they practice isn't Christianity. It's moral therapeutic deism. And I read that and I thought the same thing. Huh? What is that? Moral therapeutic deism. He defines it like this. It's worshiping a God who blesses people who are good, who are nice and fair, and helps believers 
to be happy and feel good about oneself. Does that sound like the faith? Does that sound like the life that you have attached your Christianity to? God blesses me. God takes care of me. God helps me as long as I'm nice and good. I do X, he does Y. The better I am, the more that I get. See, the problem with this is that this is not Christianity at all. Christianity is not be good and God will make you happy. Jesus, throughout his ministry, throughout his uh, time here on earth, told his followers that following him, it means taking up your cross, a symbol of dying to self, that, we are den- that we're identified with his suffering, that because they persecuted him, they will persecute us. Life will not just be easier because we follow Jesus. See, when our idea of Christianity crashes against God's reality of following Jesus, we see uh, what Christian Smith discovered, that we shouldn't be surprised when people of any age walk away from their faith. And this very reason is why Jesus tells us. He's trying to help his followers to see what's coming so that they wouldn't stumble or walk away. And as you read through John chapter 14, 15, and 16, we see that this is the end uh, of Jesus' time on earth, and he wants them to be prepared. He's setting the stage, setting the example. And as you read it, you're kind of waiting for that corner to turn. You're kind of waiting for that moment. If this is Jesus' last hurrah speech in the locker room, come on, guys, we're going to get back out on the field. We're going to get back out there. Yeah, you're going to get kicked out. Yeah, you're going to get death threats. Trouble is on the way, but cue Eye of the Tiger Rocky music, and you're just expecting it. But you got this. I've prepared you for this, and we're going to go, and we're going to go, and we're going to make it. But that never happens. The corner doesn't turn to this rah-rah speech. It's simply, it's going to get really hard. Life is going to be a challenge. Life is going to try to knock you down. The message of Jesus is not, you've got this. You can do it. No, no, the message of the gospel is you can't do this, but God can through his son Jesus. That's the message of the gospel. It's not you're good enough or you're strong enough. It's, it's that Jesus is good enough, that he is strong enough, and if I unite my life with his, if I unite my mission to his, if I remember what he has said, I won't fall away. The good news of the gospel is only good news when we recognize that this is true, that I don't have it on my own. I can't do it by myself. I need help. Jesus knows that this, that his time is running out. His execution is coming, and he wants them to be prepared and to understand and embrace this message of the gospel, where they don't feel so confident because they've been confident up to this point because they've had Jesus right there. And he's like, I I, I don't want you to think that you can do this on your own because you need me. And as the disciples start to realize, they're going to need help for Jesus, Uh, They're going to need help to live for Jesus, like Jesus. And and the next week that we look at, next week, we're going to be uncovering where that power actually comes from as John continues through this letter. But here's where I want us to land today. To understand, come what may, I can't do this on my own. I need help. And as we wrap it all up, this this is where we land because... We live in a world where we're, we're like, ah, I got it, I'm good. Maybe you, you are living out a faith, a, a religion, a type of what you thought was Christianity to say, no, no, I'm good, I got this. I'm good enough. I can do it on my own. What we need to understand is come what may, whatever this world, whatever this life throws at us, what's ever on the other side of that door, come what may. I can't do it. I need help. See, sometimes the most spiritual thing we can do is say, I don't got this. I need help. And for most of us, that's not a very easy thing. We're not very good at expressing our need for help. At least I know I'm not. 
I like to think that I've got it. So I thought we would practice it today, and you don't even have to mean it right now. But I thought even those words coming out of your mouth could be good practice for preparing you for what is to come and when it comes to, sit, to release and say, you know what, I don't got this. I need help. Can we do this together? Go like this. All right, say, repeat this after me. I don't got this. I need help. I know some of you English people are like, God, that, it doesn't, no, just go with it, all right? I don't got this. I need help. One last time, I don't got this, I need help, and this, this is where God meets us. In my weakness, he is strong. When I stop making excuses, when I stop blaming other people, when I stop blaming other circumstances, and I begin to get honest with the fact that I don't have this, I I can't do this, I need help begins to open the door for the power of God to be demonstrated through my life. See, this, this one thing has been the struggle from the beginning of creation. From the beginning of time, way back in the Garden of Eden till today, Satan has been appealing to our desire to have what I want, how I want it. Knowing that if he can convince me that I got this, I'm good, I can, that will never recognize our true need for a savior and it worked for generation after generation we have pushed God to the edges of our lives using our faith like a lifeboat whenever I just need a little help and church has been reserved for the thing we do when we got nothing else on the calendar And instead of living life fully devoted, fully surrendered, fully sacrificed, creation has begun to worship God the way we want, rather than the way that he has called us to. A God who blesses people who are good and who are nice and who are fair and helps believers be happy and feel good about oneself. But don't miss this. Because in worshiping God like that, in grabbing onto that kind of Christianity, religion, moral deism, we've declawed the Lion of Judah. He's no longer powerful. We've watered down the purpose and power of Jesus. We've stopped selling out to the mission of God to bring the message of the gospel to the world around us. You got this. It strips away your dependency on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to do anything in your life. But your ability to say, I don't got this, but I have a Jesus, a King who does. He has what I need. What my heart was created for, only he can supply to be in real relationship with God, to be in a relationship that changes everything in my life. That's what Jesus came to bring. And if we're honest, the reason we often fear what comes through the door of life is because deep down inside, we know we don't got this. We try to feel confident, but it's getting harder and harder to convince myself that I got this under control. This idea of asking God for help feels like we're letting go of control that we think we might have, when in all reality, we've never been in control. So to say, I don't got this, I need help, positions my life, positions my heart, positions my mind in full dependency on Jesus for all that I cannot do for myself. See, Jesus knew this tendency. More importantly, he knew that there was an enemy of our soul who wants to destroy us by getting us to arrive at a place to think, I've got this, I don't need any help. Because if he can convince you of that, then he can convince you that you don't need a savior that you can be in control of your own life. And this is why. In the time that Jesus had left on this earth, he spends it telling his closest friends and disciples some uncomfortable truth that would save their soul. And the same is true for us today. The life that you were created for, the purpose and the hope, the healing, the connection, the intimacy in relationship with God, it's found when we come to the place to say, I don't, 
got this. I need help. That's when the power of God moves in my life. That's when the Spirit of God resides within me with power. That's when you gain the confidence, come what may. Not because I'm in control, but because God's grace is sufficient for me. Come what may because he's in control. His power is on display in my weakness. I don't got this, but I've got a God who does. So come what may. Because I'm united to him. You know, each of my children are different. Much like your children. But when it comes down to it, instinctively they do the very same thing. When they're hurt, uh, when something doesn't go right, when they're uh, just struggling in their mind and their thinking, when they need comfort, each one of them, each one of them does the exact same thing. They lift up their hands and they say, Dad, I need you. I need a Band-Aid. I need healing. I need comfort. I'm struggling. I need help doesn't matter how different any of my kids are. When it comes down to it, when they need someone stronger, they come to daddy, 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 help. And this is what I want to invite all of us to do today. To come to our perfect heavenly father who is faithful and true, who does not let us down. And say, I don't got this. I need help. My marriage is struggling. I don't got this. I need help. I have zero control over the latest test results from the doctor. I don't got this. I need help. My child who has wandered away, walked away, deconstructed their faith, rejected God, I don't got this. I need help. Maybe in your own heart and in your own life and in your own mind right now, the battle that's waging within you. To stop trying to muscle it down and control it and say, I don't got this. I need help. As we sing this last song, I want to invite you to just take that posture of dependency on God. I don't got this. God, I need your help. Ask God for help today to surrender your life to him. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for your word that speaks truth no matter how hard it is to hear. And right now I pray for those of us sitting here, those of us listening to this message, those of us watching online, God, would you remind us of just how broken and needy we are, that we are like little children that can't do it on our own, that we need help. Today we come to you for full surrender and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord. That God, it is your love that motiv motivated you to send your son Jesus to bridge the gap between my sin, the evil in this world, the evil in me, and a perfect and holy God. And today, I surrender my life and I embrace Jesus by faith. That you are my help. That you are my strength. Jesus, that you are the only one that can save me. And today, I ask that you would not just, not just make me new. God, that you would reconstruct me, that you would tear down the walls of my brokenness and my pride and my self-dependency that you would rebuild me to who you've called me to be, that my life, that my actions, my attitudes, that everything about me would be united and aligned with who you are. 
that my life would be found in you. Your strength and your power. In Jesus' name, amen.